Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you.
Let us pray. O oh God, powerful and compassionate, you shepherd your people, faithfully feeding and protecting us. Heal each of us and make us a whole people that we may embody the justice and peace of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Today's first reading is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. Jeremiah prophesied before exile in 587 BCE. In this passage, he uses the metaphor of a shepherd to describe the bad kings who have scattered the flock of Israel. God promises to gather the flock and to raise up a new king from David's line to save Israel and Judah. A reading from Jeremiah. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock, and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply." I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures, and leads me beside still waters. To restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Today's second reading is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. The author of this letter reminds his audience that originally they were not part of God's chosen people. Through Jesus' death, however, they are included in God's household of faith, whose cornerstone is Jesus Christ. A reading from Ephesians. Remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. 
for he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one, and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Word of God, Word of Life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, People at once recognized them and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak and all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning, everybody. I hope that uh, you've had a great week, and I welcome you uh, to this virtual moment when we will gather around these four precious lessons that uh, we use to draw our uh, minds and our hearts toward God during this um, moment of worship. Uh, the Lord be with you. 
Now, I grew up in Richland, and whenever we traveled uh, westbound to Tacoma and Bremerton to visit our families there, we passed through country that is now planted with vineyards. But in the 50s, when I was a kid, much of this land was ranched uh, by shepherds uh, with flocks of sheep, uh, cattle with cowboys as well. But for a moment, sheep herders and their dogs tending their flocks of sheep a uh, familiar sight, and I want to recall uh, that image of my uh, growing up uh, as we traveled through the countryside of eastern Washington on our way to the mountain passes. Among the important differences, uh, at least we were told so, um, between the cowboys and their cattle um, and the shepherds and their sheep is that sheep herders lived with their flocks year-round and as a result there was a kind of familiarity uh, cultivated between shepherds and sheep so that they shepherds knew their their sheep by appearance and even gave some of them uh, pet names there, there was this sense that Jeremiah speaks of as, as a knowledge of no sheep shall be missing. Uh, that sense of intimacy or familiarity between the shepherd and the flock of sheep. They knew where the green pastures uh, were and the still waters and they knew the routes to them and the dangers that they would face so that they could protect their flocks of sheep um, on, on the way to food. And, and Israel's uh, culture, the ancient Near Eastern world generally, was pastoral, rural, very different than today's world. Uh, the economy and sociology was not technology. It was rather organized around uh, sheep and sheep herding and protecting the land and the streams that fed their flocks. Um, they were educated not in how to use a computer, but shepherds were educated in how to protect the, these land, these lands of green pasture and the streams of still waters that were necessary to feed their their flocks. So, so this metaphor of shepherd to characterize God's care of Israel or of Israel as a flock of God's sheep. We find this throughout scripture uh, as a way of depicting or helping first readers who knew that culture very well uh, understand uh, the relationship between uh, the God of Israel and the people of God who had covenanted with God for salvation. Uh, so, uh, so it's not uncommon that we find this language in the Bible lessons that we study, and in, indeed the lessons before us today are uh, full of this language of sheep and sheep herding and uh, shepherd. Now, what I want to make clear before I go any further with this uh, is that the purpose of the biblical writers in using this uh, language is not a romantic one. Their intention was not to evoke warm fuzzies in their readers. The purpose is entirely practical uh, because it gave to their readers uh, a handle by which they could grasp what otherwise would be a revolutionary, uncommon, idea of God, that the Lord God, the creator of all things, the sovereign of the universe, can be understood as a shepherd leading God's people as though a band of sheep to green pastures and still waters to restore them, to comfort them so they might live with God in God's house forever. That personal, 
caring image uh, is, is a radical idea even today uh, in ways in which we think and believe about God. But there is a problem, and it's the problem that today's lessons uh, confront, especially the Old Testament lesson from Jeremiah, the Gospel lesson from Mark 6. It's that sometimes God's flock, God's people, are viewed as a sheep without a shepherd. Uh, they are without someone to lead and guide them to those waters of restoration. For instance, in our Old Testament lesson, the prophet Jeremiah uh, addresses an exiled people whom God observes is in exile under the authority of a pagan uh, king in captivity because of the incompetent shepherds that destroyed them. That word destroyed is essentially to take uh, property from them, to lose land. Um, and it's a way of talking about an exile as the loss of land and on all the things that governed and uh, made Israel's occupation of their land possible. All of that has been lost because of incompetent shepherds, the politicians, the religious people, the, uh, the people that were given the task of guiding Israel uh, in a right relationship with God who would support and, and give to them all that they needed. That's the promise of the covenant. And uh, so uh, Jeremiah's congregation uh, is exiled from the promised land because they were a sheep without a shepherd. Uh, spiritually competent, politically alert leaders who could guide Israel into a right relationship with God. They didn't have that. So uh, God says then to this sheep without a shepherd in verses 3 and 4 of our Old Testament lesson uh, that I will become, God will become the shepherd uh, and will lead Israel, now with a good shepherd, back into uh, prosperity, multiply, and be fruitful, language from creation. So in mind is this new creation into which God will lead this flock that had been abandoned by incompetent leadership before. God goes on to say that God will send uh, a righteous shoot of David named the Lord of our righteousness to be the one who will lead Israel into new creation. Now we read Jeremiah with our gospel lesson and we not only know who that righteous shoot of David is, who will lead and feed God's flock back into right relationship with God, it is of course Jesus who is our Lord of righteousness. But what is key about this story, this gospel lesson, I think, is not only that it presumes that Jesus is that competent shepherd who actually will lead Israel, God's people, into right relationship with God, indeed into the, the new creation. It's, it's that Mark uh, actually uses language that helps us understand what motivates Jesus uh, to act in this way. Now, one of the things that you need to know about gospel stories about Jesus is that very, very rarely uh, do the storytellers ever talk about what is going on inside of Jesus, what he is feeling, what he is uh, thinking, what motivates him uh, to act and to say what he does. Uh, gospel stories are plotted by action. They are action stories. They, they tell what Jesus did. They, they tell what Jesus said. Uh, they talk about collisions and conflicts that Jesus has with his opponents. They rarely open a window 
uh, to what he is feeling, uh, what he is thinking. Uh, but here it does. Here the story does. Uh, and it uses a very special word that I really love. It, the, the Greek word is splachnein. I just love the sound of that word. And it actually literally means guts. So this is a story that gives us a picture of, of Jesus' gut feelings when he encounters a, a, a crowd uh, as a shepherd who recognizes that this crowd is a sheep without a shepherd, as the gospel lesson puts it. Now this word splachnein, this gut feeling, this this sense that we get, this feeling that we get when we encounter people in need is typically translated compassion, but I, but I rather prefer uh, the word empathy to translate Schlocknein, so that Jesus had empathy. Uh, he was empathetic toward these, toward these people. He felt that they were sheep who needed a shepherd, and Jesus took on that role and taught them. In the next story, fed the 5,000, and then in the story that concludes our gospel lesson, heals them, so teaches and feeds and, and heals the, the, the actions of a good shepherd uh, who leads the flock to green pastures and still waters. Now, uh, the other two lessons sandwiched between Jeremiah and the gospel uh, give to us much more language, they sort of elaborate uh, on um, where this all is leading us. I think we, we sort of, when we, when we think of Jesus as Good Shepherd, we, we tend to think of what he does as Good Shepherd, or we think of the sheep who are in need of someone like Jesus to save them or deliver them or restore them or heal them or teach them. But if we look carefully at Psalm 23 and Ephesians 2, the Psalm and the New Testament lesson, and we read these passages from back to front, rather than front to back, uh, we will get, I think, a better understanding of the holy end. Where is it that the Good Shepherd is leading God's people? Especially, I think, Psalm 23 sets us up very nicely. Because when we read this psalm, very familiar to us all, we tend to think of it as the Shepherd's Psalm. We tend to think that this is a psalm that uh, is sung in praise of God who is our Good Shepherd, and that, that is totally legitimate. And that, of course, is the first two stanzas of this poem. Uh, God is introduced as uh, our Good Shepherd, and because of this we shall not want, because God leads us to uh, that which sustains us and protects us. All that is, is played out in the opening stanzas. But take a look or think about that last stanza of Psalm 23. There, a God is no longer a shepherd. We are no longer God's sheep. God becomes the hospitable, gracious host who serves uh, the needs of guests who are not really guests, they're members of God's household. And, and there God nurtures and gives to them what they need for the rest of their days. So the image is no longer of a pasture land where a shepherd is herding sheep. It is of a host who is caring for members of, of a household. And I think that's the image that we should keep in mind. That's the dynamic that we keep in mind. We are being shepherded by a righteous shepherd so that we might uh, enter into an eternal relationship with God and live with God in God's household forever. Now it really is, I think, the Ephesians 2 passage which, which unpacks this. If you look at the way that passage ends, uh, you will note that there, there is a series of architectural terms that Paul uses 
to craft this idea of the church as God's household. We are God's household, Paul boldly says. But what that means is that we think of ourselves as dwelling in a place with a firm foundation, and this foundation is a poured by the witnesses of the Old Testament prophets and by the New Testament apostles. Uh, this foundation has as its cornerstone Jesus. The stones that are used to build this building uh, are followers of Jesus, you, you and I. We are the stones that make for this structure. And this structure follows a blueprint that erects a temple in worship of God. And that is where we live. That is our home because we worship God forever and ever. And our worship of God, verse 22 says, uh, our worship in this temple, which is the shape of God's household for forever, uh, is the Holy Spirit who inspires and animates uh, our life and our worship with God. Now, those images crafted in this architectural language gives to us, it seems to me, a good sense of where it is the Good Shepherd is leading us, leading us into a life with God that might be reimagined as life within God's household, where the thing that is done uh, is worship God, and the Spirit is there to animate that worship and that life with God. So what begins in chaos, despair, without prospect or hopeful future, uh, a world without green pasture or still water, uh, because uh, of a people without a shepherd, now experiences uh, a great reversal uh, because of Jesus, this Lord who is our righteousness, who leads us out of hopelessness and out of despair. Uh, into a right relationship with God. That is gospel. Uh, that is what we witness to. That is what we own and believe in with all our hearts. One, one thing I would say in, in bringing this uh, sermon to conclusion is what Paul earlier speaks of in Ephesians 2, um, which I think is relevant for ways in which we might understand this great reversal uh, for our contemporary world. I think the question that our congregation must ask is how is the Christian gospel, uh, a gospel that teaches us that the Lord is a good shepherd that leads us out of hopelessness and into a household of God animated in worship uh, and life uh, by God's spirit forever. Uh, how, how is that idea, belief, image relevant for a world, a culture, society that seems to be uh, occupied by discussions of inclusion and diversity, uh, generational differences, racial differences, gender differences, socioeconomic differences, political differences, national differences, many ways in which the, the problem of diversity gets expressed uh, today, and some of which I talked about last Sunday. How, for heaven's sake, can we tame this diversity in ways that build unity, a unity that includes all kinds of, of uh, diversity and gets us all headed in the right direction together? I think most of us can admit that today's world is fractured. The church, which should be the body of Christ, is a broken body, fractured bones. And while we all recognize this, the solution that we often hear proposed, whether by the pundits or by the preachers, is to defend or to define what makes each of us unique and different whether that is party affiliation or the tribe to which we belong, our social and political responses to the problem of diversity is not to propose ways to include us all, 
uh, or to unify us around common ends, but it is rather to make clear why and how each of us is different from all others, whom we might accept as different, but whom we keep at arm's length, giving them their own spaces, their own sacred uh, places. Paul's response is, the Bible's response is, God's response is radically different than this. God's home is a hospitable place where people who were once outsiders, without hope, without God in the world, Paul's description in verse 12, who were once excluded, shoved to the margins because of their differences, are now brought near because of Christ. So Paul can say this in verses 14 and 15, and I want you to listen uh, to my translation, kind of a paraphrase of, of this text that has already been read for us, because I think it's a great theme verse for Peace Lutheran because of the way Paul uses peace in this text. He says, Christ is our peace. He is the one who has made different groups into one. He is the one who demolished, who demoed the walls that divided us, the hostility that othered people as our enemies. And he did this by creating one new people, one fold of sheep out of several different flocks. Thus, making peace. It's the way that text concludes. Now the biblical idea of peace or shalom as prophesied by God's Old Testament prophets targets a people's life with God when violence ends, abusive name calling ceases, when a, when a world history at odds with, with different others ends when a world reconciled because of Jesus through God's Spirit is realized. That's the sociology of God's household. That's the good news that we can offer all others in Jesus' name who search for a place that includes them, uh, not only includes them, but with whom there is a kind of solidarity of common purpose. They are headed in a common direction. And I think that is what this congregation, whose name is Peace, is called upon to testify, not only in our neighborhood, but perhaps uh, to uh, today's broken world um, culture that's a mess uh, a, a social world that is fraught with all kinds of divisions and conflicts uh, where there is quite obviously uh, a sheep without a shepherd uh, but a sheep in need of and in search of green pastures and still waters that the gospel can provide them. Saints, if you agree with me that this is a problem we face and that you agree with me that Jesus is the answer to that problem, let us uh, come together as Peace Lutheran to embody this good news, to testify to God's unifying peace uh, in, a manner, in the manner of our worship together, in the manner of our life together, uh, and in the manner of our ministry of the gospel together. Amen.
Let us join in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit, we offer up our prayers for the Church, the world, and all of creation. Tend your church, O God. Encourage bishops, pastors, and deacons in their proclamation of the gospel. Raise up new leaders and encourage those pursuing a call to ministry. Embolden all the baptized to embody your love and justice. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Restore your creation, O God. Sustain croplands and pastures and safeguard all farm animals and livestock. Preserve lakes, rivers, and streams that offer refreshment. Revive lands recovering from natural disasters and protect coastlands threatened by rising oceans. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Reconcile the nations, O God. Break down the dividing walls that make us strangers to one another and unite us as one human family. Equip leaders to deal wisely with conflict and guide diplomats who seek peaceful resolutions. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Heal your people, O God. Look with those compassion on immigrants, exiles, and all who are afraid or feel lost. Give rest to those who are weary, comfort those who are grieving, and recovery to those who are ill. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Nourish this congregation, O God. Prepare a table where we receive food for our hungering spirits. Renew our commitment to provide for one another and revitalize our ministries of feeding and nurturing hungry neighbors. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You lead us home, O God. We give thanks for all who have died, now citizens with the saints. As you have received them into your heavenly home, so welcome all of us to dwell in your house forever. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We lift these and all our prayers to you, O God, confident in the promise of your saving love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always and also with you.
Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join your unending hymn. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. We praise you for the grace shown to your people in every age, the promise to Israel the rescue from Egypt, the gift of the promised land, the words of the prophets, and at this end of all the ages, the gift of your Son, who proclaimed the good news in word and deed and was obedient to your will, even to giving his life. In the night in which he was betrayed, Our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. <clears throat> Christ will come again. Therefore, O God, with this bread and cup, 
we remember the life our Lord offered for us. And believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we who share in Christ's body and blood may live to the praise of your glory and receive our inheritance with all your saints in light. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Join our prayers with those of your servants of every time and every place and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all through him, with him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor is yours. Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come. The body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Gracious God, loving all your family with a mother's tender care, As you sent the angel to feed Elijah with heavenly bread, assist those who set forth to share your word and sacrament with those who are sick, homebound, and imprisoned. In your love and care, nourish and strengthen those who will receive this sacrament and give us all the comfort of your abiding presence through the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
The only announcement of which I am aware is that of our reopening um, as a community of believers in Jesus Christ, Peace Lutheran Fellowship in Port Ludlow. We shall gather in person, um, obeying all of the rules of safety and so on that we know about, and those of the Beach Club, um, when we gather next Sunday on July 25th at the Beach Club in Port Ludlow at 10 a.m. for a wonderful reopening service. And we hope that all of you can join us at that time. We will also be doing some um, live streaming rather than to be having our um, typical YouTube presentation. We can't do both. And so um, there will be live streaming from the uh, worship service as it is going on, but it can be accessed later on um, if that is your choice or, or your particular need. But we do hope that you will join us and be mindful that um, the Beach Club does have very strict guidelines relative to vaccinations and masking and so on. So if you are not vaccinated, be certain that you are masked. So we do look forward to it. Um, we've been waiting for a long, long time. So um, glory be to God um, who brings all good things. And now, may the blessing of God, who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us, be upon you now and forever. Amen. Peace. You are the body of Christ. 
Thanks be to God.